everybody. Uh, and so welcome to the second day of our uh, workshop here. Uh, the morning sessions will consist of two talks. Uh, the first by Fabrice Bert, uh, uh, describing and explaining to us how to probe electronic properties of frustrated magnets uh, employing NMR. Uh, then we'll have a coffee break. And after that, we'll have the second talk uh, on uh, another uh, by Bella Lake, uh, who's going to talk about uh, you know, employing inelastic and you know different forms of neutron scattering to reveal the underlying correlations of frustrated magnets. So with this, let's welcome Fabrice Bert from the University of Paris Saclay. Oh, and Fabrice, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Yasir. So, uh, well, first thing, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for for the conference and the tutorial part. Uh, so uh, it's really a pleasure to be back uh, in India, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so, and uh, and especially, I would like to, to thank you all uh, for being here this morning. So in the room and also online. So um, the organizers uh, asked me to uh, give a tutorial on the use of nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, to investigate uh, the electronic properties in material and uh, in general and a bit more particularly in uh, the kind of system we, we, we like to look at, like uh, correlated matter, basically. Okay. And indeed, uh, during the conference, you will have at least uh, three talks which are really clearly related to NMR and maybe, uh, maybe a bit more. So the aim of the tutorial is that you are able, if you know nothing about NMR, you are able to follow a bit this talk. Yeah. Well, to follow fully these talks. Okay. So if at the end of the week, you, you'll tell me if I was successful or not. Um, so, that's okay. So let, let's get uh, started uh, gently. Uh, I've got a few uh, uh, general uh, slides uh, just to, to warm up, and then we'll go to the to the details. Okay. It was working super nice, but it doesn't for some reason. I'll try once again. Well, it doesn't like it anymore. Well, we'll, we'll do manually then. Right. Okay. Well, it's putting, may, maybe just terminate the sharing. And we can restart again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Looks better. So, uh, I like to show this uh, Nobel Prize related to to NMR, which sets a bit the, the context, uh, historical and scientific. Uh, so there are a lot of big names there. Uh, the reason is, uh, so it tells you that uh, basically NMR uh, is really related to basic uh, quantum mechanics phenomena, uh, like uh, Zeeman, Rabi oscillation, etc. And that was very important, uh, well, to test quantum mechanics at the early days of quantum mechanics, to understand what was a quantized level, uh, how you can mani uh, what, uh, how you can manipulate the population on the level, etc. Okay. And then these two guys, uh, Block and Purcell, they are the one who uh, are the official inventors of the NMR technique, uh, and uh, and the, the NMR we are doing is uh, is uh, more or less the same as what they, they invented. And then uh, it uh, evolved a lot, and it evolved, and it gets uh, very uh, sophisticated in the two main fields, which are the two uh, largely dominant application fields of NMR these days, uh, which are uh, chemistry there, 
and uh, medicine. So chemistry, uh, it goes with uh, exploring the structure of molecules and now you can uh, uh, work out the structure of super large molecules like protein, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, the development in, uh, in medicine is for imaging. So you use NMR to make image of a brain or whatever. Uh, and uh, so the, the NMR applied to imaging, it's called magnetic resonance imaging MRI, as you know. Okay. So that's really the two main application of uh, uh, NMR. And uh, that's exactly what I will not talk about uh, here. That's, uh, that's not what is interesting to us. Uh, we will look at other things. We'll use NMR to study the electronic properties, which is really a tiny, tiny application of uh, NMR. Basically, uh, to give you an order of magnitude, it's like, I don't know, less than 50 uh, groups in the world who are doing the kind of things I, I will present at that, which are interesting to us, basically. Okay. So uh, just this is uh, historical, that's the paper of uh, Block and Purcell, the discovery of NMR. Just to mention the date, that's 46, 45, that's right after the war, uh, because uh, you needed the development of uh, radio frequency technologies, basically, uh, to be able to do, uh, to do NMR uh, in a standard way. This is MRI, as you know it. I hope you don't know it too much, but uh, it's basically an NMR spectrometer. This is NMR for chemistry. If you went to a chemistry lab, there is an NMR setup, certainly. And the game is to go to uh, uh, high fields, strong fields, to, to, to have a very nice resolution of the lines and being able to, uh, uh, to explore the, the structure of the, of the molecules. But uh, and the, this is uh, really the two main application of uh, NMR these days, and this is this I will not talk about. Okay. It gets very specialized, very sophisticated, and and, uh, and that's another uh, completely another subject. And I would not be the good person to to give talk neither on MRI or uh, NMR for uh, structure of molecules. What we're interested in here is how to use NMR to study the electronic properties in materials. So materials uh, uh, where you have some magnetic properties, so basically it can be some uh, metallic uh, materials, uh, magnetic materials where somewhere where you have uh, unpaired electrons. So that's not what you have in biological system. So we want to use NMR uh, to measure the basic uh, magnetic quantities like static susceptibility. Okay, so I will try to tell you how you do that and why you would like to do that rather than using a standard squid. You can use NMR to measure also the spin dynamics. So you have a view on the excitation of your system. That's through relaxation process. That's called spin lattice relaxation. That's this T1. So I will explain to you what, what it is and what you really measure with that. That's the main part of the, of the talk. And then uh, I'll show you that uh, NMR is also sensitive to the, somehow to the electric field uh, through uh, quadrupolar uh, interaction. So you're sensitive to force, with it's uh, it means that you're sensitive to the, the crystal structure, basically. So you, you can probe structural changes and, uh, and stuff like that. Okay. That's a bit more technical, but that can be important. And uh, when we know all that, I'll give you a very small uh, uh, example uh, of application in, uh, in a frustrated magnet, which is uh, Herbert's missile. That will really be a very short introduction because you will have talks uh, during the day, uh, during the week, uh, the next two weeks. And uh, I will end up, if time allows, uh, with uh, some discussion, uh, well, some details, uh, small details on uh, NMR technique without, without entering uh, technicities. Okay. Okay. So let's get uh, started. Um, so I've got, uh, so and, uh, let, let's try to understand a bit of the basics of NMR and uh, how, why you are uh, sensitive to the magnetic properties, basically. 
So I've got uh, two slides which are unwritten. That's the most important part of the talk. So uh, with that, so we, uh, if you can concentrate on that and uh, feel free, obviously I didn't say, but feel free to ask any question. And then after that, you can sleep if you want. You will have just pictures. Okay, so uh, we want to use the nuclear moment uh, of uh, the, nucle the nuclei. So uh, many nuclei do have a, a spin actually, not all of them. But uh, sometimes if, uh, uh, if a nucleus doesn't have a spin, like uh, oxygen-16, for instance, you can find an isotope which will have one, like oxygen-17. So you can use many nuclei at the end of the day. They are not all uh, as good as, uh, as others. Uh, there are different sensitivities, etc. But you, you can use uh, a lot in the periodic table provided you may enrich your sample. So uh, this is the MI, what I call MI, that's the magnetic moment. Uh, the magnetic moment is related to the nuclear spin I. And uh, so the size of this moment uh, is quantized by uh, the nuclear Bohr magneton. The nuclear Bohr magneton is the equivalent of the Bohr magneton for the electron, and it's about 1,000 times smaller than the Bohr uh, magneton for the electron. And that's because the proton is 1,000 1, times uh, uh, heavier than the electron. Basically. So uh, nuclear magnetism is small quantity. Okay? And MR is dealing with small quantity intrinsically because uh, nuclear magnetism is small. Now, uh, we usually don't use this kind of, uh, of uh, expression for the moment. We rather express the size of the moment by a, a factor which is called a geromagnetic ratio, uh, which may look a bit strange at first sight, but I will explain, uh, which is so that just the size of the moment. Huh? That's uh, the equivalent of this kind of Landé factor times the, the Bohr magneton. And so this is this quantity that you can find uh, anywhere on the uh, table. If you type in uh, NMR periodic table on, your, uh, on the web, you, you will find values for the, the different nuclei. This is all set by nuclear physics that is completely independent of your material. So it just depends on the isotope you're looking at. So there are, as I say, you can use many nuclei. Uh, very good ones are, for instance, uh, proton, that's the largest uh, moment uh, with a, a gamma that is close to 40 megahertz per Tesla or gamma over 2 pi. Uh, but okay, there are, there are overs with different gamma, different spins, etc. Uh, just a parenthesis to tell you that um, uh, why we have this funny name uh, for the size of a moment? Uh, it's because if you work out uh, the evolution of a moment in a uniform magnetic field, so the moment experiences a, a torque that is mi cross uh, b zero, and so the, the evolution. So if you multiply that by gamma, you get this uh, uh, equation of moment, and uh, which is just a simple precession of uh, the nuclear moment around B0 at a frequency which is gamma times B0. So this quantity gamma times B0 is actually a rotation speed. Okay, so that's why gamma is called geromagnetic ratio, and that's a characteristic of uh, your nuclei. Okay. And, uh, and it, that it's uh, it's actually, this frequency is actually uh, usually called Larmor frequency. So that's the natural uh, rotation speed of your, of your nuclei. Okay. So at the quantum level, uh, you couple your moment uh, to uh, the external field uh, B0, static uniform external field B0. Uh, the Zeeman effect will split the levels of your nuclei. So if you have a nucleus with a spin i, uh, you will have two, two i plus one levels. Spin five half will have five levels. They are equally spread, and the distance between two levels 
uh, is uh, if you work it out from that, it's just uh, H bar gamma uh, B zero. So that's uh, actually the, the Larmor frequency. That's the rotation speed of your uh, nuclei. Okay. So now what do we do with uh, NMR? Uh, in an NMR experiment, you will uh, induce transition between adjacent levels by irradiating your system with uh, a frequency. And uh, this will work out if uh, the frequency you use is exactly equal to the spacing between two levels. Okay, this is a resonant uh, technique. So for, to do that, you need an, extern, an additional external field. So you have a static uniform field B0, and you need another field that will induce the transition. This one is, uh, is a frequent, uh, is a time-dependent uh, oscillating field. And if it's exactly at the right frequency, if nu is equal to the spacing, uh, then you can induce transition. You need also that B1 is perpendicular to uh, B0, that's the transverse component of the fluctuation field that induces the transition. That's very classical. So what is uh, an NMR spectrum? An NMR spectrum is the histogram of the different resonance frequency that you have uh, in, your, uh, in your system as a function of the, the frequency. Okay. So for each, you can tune uh, the or you can um, scan the frequency of your B1 field. And for each frequency, you can monitor how many uh, nuclei have this specific resonance frequency. And that's the NMR spectrum. So number, the N, what we call the NMR intensity, but that's a number of nuclei that's proportional to a number of nuclei as a function of uh, the frequency. So in my uh, example, we had one, uh, because the levels are equally spaced, you have one uh, resonance frequency at nu zero, which is the Larmor frequency. So you expect that all your uh, nuclei will uh, resonate, uh, will give a response at this uh, specific frequency. Okay. So with NMR, uh, NMR measures accurately this Larmor frequency. So it measures actually, with a great accuracy, the, the field. The Larmor frequency, it's the field, basically. It's B0. So what it does, NMR, uh, it's a magnetometer. So it just measures the field at the nucleus position, okay, with a great accuracy. Because it measures the Larmor frequency for a given nucleus, and the Larmor frequency is just proportional to the field probed by this nucleus. Okay, so why is it interesting? So, and uh, actually, if you want to measure uh, with accu accurately a, a field uh, with using a Tesla meter, a Tesla meter is an NMR spectrometer. Basically. That's how you measure field. So now in matter, which is interesting to us, of interest is that uh, at the nuclear position, you will feel the external field B0, but also, uh, small local fields, which are due to the surrounding unpaired electrons. So it can be due to uh, conduction electron going close to your nuclei, uh, unpaired uh, spin somewhere, giving some magnetism, etc. So uh, this will shift your resonance frequency. It will not be anymore at U0, but at a new frequency slightly shifted. And that's this shift that is the important quantity in NMR, is how much your line is different from what you would expect if the nuclei was uh, isolated. <laughs> so uh, the new resonance frequency will be uh, gamma times the new field, B0 plus B local. So it just the reference frequency, that we call the reference frequency, plus gamma times the local field. And the quantity we measure, which is usually called night shift or uh, NMR shift or NMR line shift, that, that's the same thing. Uh, it's the relative variation of this uh, resonance frequency. So nu minus nu zero divided by nu zero. So that's just the ratio of a local field to the external field. So that this quantity that will tell us about the magnetic environment uh, of your material and that's a quantity that, will, uh, that we will use. 
Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, Carlo, <laughs> from a student. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how it works? That, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, how it works usually? So you will always give a shift with respect to some reference. So in a good NMR paper, you should say, okay, I measured like a sodium NMR in uh, sodium chlorine. I've got the reference there, and now I measure it in my uh, funny material, my cobaltate or whatever and I found uh, the frequency there. So I, I've got a shift with respect to uh, boring material, which is that. And setting the zero is a difficult question usually. It's a small quantity, but it's, it's difficult. Yeah? yeah? So, you, well, in some cases, you, you can use a small, it's a question of intensity, basically. The NMR intensity goes like B square. That, that will make it uh, clear after. So, when you go from one Tesla to 10 Tesla, that's 100 in your signal. Okay. Uh, but still, uh, it's a question of intensity. So, if you take a very big sample, you could use a small B0. Uh, you can do NMR in the earth field. If you use like a big pack of water, a uh, lot of protons, uh, you can work out in, uh, in this. But it's just a question of intensity. So, um, how is your uh, spin? Uh, so now, uh, why, why do we, the question is why do we have some? Uh, where does it come from? This uh, local field. Okay, I told you it's because you have an electron close to your uh, nucleus. But okay, let's go in a bit more into the details. So uh, what happens is that uh, you have your nuclear spin and you have somewhere uh, unpaired uh, electron spin. So if they are close enough, they will interact, typically by dipolar coupling, and, uh, and that will give a local field at the nuclear site, basically. So let, let's work that out. Uh, so the, that's what is called the hyperfine coupling, that's a coupling of the nuclear spin and the electron spin. It goes like that. You can always express it like uh, the, this form where A uh, will be type, typically a dipolar coupling, okay. a matrix that encodes the interaction between uh, the two spins. So this you can rewrite like that. Uh, you, you just uh, substitute, uh, well, you multiply high uh, by the size of the moment just to, to have a nuclear moment, and you get a form that is like a Zeeman form. So it's, it's like your Indeed, it's like your magnetic nuclear moment is interacting with some effective field, which I will call the local field, which is uh, proportional to the, to the spin, to the electronic spin that is uh, not far from your, uh, not far from your uh, nucleus. Okay. So what we measure, NMR, it's a long measurement, so uh, you will uh, uh, average out all the fluctuation of this local field. You will just measure on a spectrum uh, the, the average of this uh, local field. And the average of the local field, so if you just plug that. So this is the quantity that I call the local field, and the average is related to, average, to the average of, uh, of this, which is just the electronic moment. Okay. And this average electronic moment, it's the magnetization of your material. But the magnetization of the electrons which are close to your nuclei only. And uh, so you can uh, rewrite this local field as a function of uh, the, the magnetization, the local magnetization. And then, well, then it depends a bit on the case, but uh, in a paramagnetic regime, imagine a spin liquid uh, material, it, you're usually in the linear regime, there's no, uh, no static magnetism. Uh, then M is uh, just uh, proportional to the external field B0, with, uh, and the, the ratio is the, the susceptibility, which I'll call local, because again, uh, you're probing the electron nearby the, the nucleus. And so uh, your, uh, the shift at the end of the day, you remember it's the local field 
the ratio of the local field to uh, B0. So it's just proportional to the susceptibility. And the constant there, so it's related to, uh, to this guy. This you usually don't know. Uh, it's an experimental quantity. I wrote it here as a scalar, but it's usually a tensor. But okay, uh, that's like that. That's uh, anyway, it's uh, temperature independent uh, and it's constant. That's a multiplying constant, uh, which gives you the proportionality, basically. Okay. Uh, No, this we don't care because uh, it ju it's just the, it's the, the, st the strength uh, of the, the coupling, but uh, it's not an energy that you, you would uh, excite, or you cannot excite this energy or something. It's, it's just the energy of the coupling. We usually give it uh, in Tesla per mu b, this uh, hyperfine coupling, so it tells you uh, uh, if you have one mu b around your nuclei, it tells you how much how many Tesla you will give uh, as a local field. Okay. So uh, now we just uh, for the following uh, with NMR you can also measure the fluctuation of this local field uh, that will give a relaxation uh, process uh, for your NMR line which I didn't touch so far. Okay. Now I'm just considering the static properties that you, you get from the spectrum. Okay, so we are, we are done mostly. Uh, so just to, to summarize, uh, so if you have uh, nuclei uh, with their spin that the red uh, arrows in some environment and the environment is all the same, then all these nuclei, they have the same Larmor frequency. They resonate at the same frequency, same local field, and, uh, and uh, that's it. Now, uh, if for some reason you have one of these nuclei that has a different environment because there's a, an additional electron, an impurity, whatever, uh, close to it. Uh, the local field for this one will be different. So it will resonate at a different local field, different Larmor frequency. And importantly, remember the NMR spectrum is an histogram. Uh, so the, the y-axis is actually proportional to the number of detected nuclei. So the size of these peaks tells you how many nuclei, nuclei are in such environment. So you know what, is the, what are the different local fields and how many nuclei are, what fraction of your sample is probing this or this uh, local field. Okay. And then, okay, you can imagine, then you can just follow the position of this line with respect to some parameter. We can be temperature, we can be pressure, and uh, you will get local susceptibility at different sites in your materials as a function of external parameter. So le let's go a little bit more into the detail of this A, this uh, hyperfine uh, coupling uh, between the nuclear spin and the uh, free electron, well, uh, unpaired electron, right? So it, it goes in a bit more detail, it goes like that. So you have a first term, so uh, the small l here is, uh, so, I, okay, uh, I have one uh, nucleus with one spin i, okay? Yeah. And then I've got one electron which, uh, with uh, angular momentum l, small l, and a spin small s. Okay, so the, the first term uh, is what is called the chemical, the, it, it, it traces back to orbital effect. So basically it tells you, uh, uh, it's not the quantity which is very interesting for us. It tells you, uh, so around your nucleus you have uh, electrons, okay, on their orbitals. And it tells you how the orbitals are slightly modified by the external field. So that gives an additional local field uh, on the nuclear nucleus uh, site. So this is uh, when you do uh, 
chemistry and you want to understand uh, if your uh, carbon atom is uh, in a CH3 group or a CH2 group or a CH and how many orbitals are around, that's the, this term that you are using. Okay? It will depend on the chemistry around your nucleus. But this we don't care, it's, so it's, it's, it's small anyway, compared to all the other effects that, uh, that we are measuring uh, when you have unpaired electron in your system, because this guy, they will give a uh, large field, uh, unpaired electron, compared to this small effect, uh, it's, uh, it's a super large local field. So, and this is just the dipolar coupling of uh, your electron spin to uh, the nuclear spin. Okay. You recognize, I guess, you saw it yesterday uh, in the talk of Carlo, that the, the dipolar interaction, basically. Okay. So it's there, a dipolar interaction. Now, this term, it's called the contact term. It's the case where, and uh, this is possible, imagine you have uh, S electrons. They have a non-zero probability to sit directly at the nuclear site. So uh, this dipolar interaction, it can diverge actually. Uh, R can go to zero. And this is the, the treatment for this diversion that's called the uh, contact interaction. So if this term is present, it obviously dominates all the others. And uh, that's a very simple case actually, uh, where the, 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 the hyperfine interaction is just a scalar. And uh, that, that's the easiest one. And when it's big and it's there, uh, it's very nice. Otherwise, uh, it's not very complicated. So you have this term, but it's constant in temperature and just related to your orbitals. It's a constant term, small and constant term of temperature. And this is where you have the physics, but all this, you can pack it up because it's always term like I dot S. So you can pack it as uh, I dot some tensor matrix dot S, basically, which is what I wrote in the, in the first slide. So at the end of the day, it looks like that. So your uh, shift, uh, so the resonance frequency, so it's the nu zero, uh, the gamma A zero will give you nu zero, and then you have a different shift. So the orbital, what is called the orbital shift or chemical shift, which is temperature independent and small, and the interesting quantity, uh, which is your, uh, the spin shift, what is called the spin shift. Um, which is uh, then uh, directly related to uh, the, the susceptibility and to be precise, the, really the, the uniform and static uh, susceptibility, Q equals zero or omega equals zero. Okay. Good. So why uh, would we use NMR? Uh, to measure uh, chi of q equals zero, omega equals zero, instead of using a squid. And why should we bother? Because actually it is, it's not the same time scale and uh, it's not the same involvement uh, to measure NMR uh, as a, a standard measurement with, a, with squid. Uh, it's a time scale of uh, months with respect to one day, basically. So why we should bother? Uh, because you, you have uh, actually a very uh, complementary and more detailed information. Uh, first, uh, this is uh, local. I think you understand now wh what it means, your measurement. So uh, you're not annoyed by, uh, well, uh, in principle, you're not annoyed by uh, impurities. So imagine your sample has some impurity that happens uh, more often than, uh, than not. And uh, if you put that in the squid, you will measure also uh, this uh, impurity phase. In NMR, uh, the signal is proportional to the, 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 the nucleus that you have in your face. So if your impurity phase is a small fraction of your sample, it will give a small fraction of your signal and you don't care. So in principle, you can access uh, more intrinsic physics and that's really important. Uh, you can measure, so I, this uh, I'll give you a small example. Uh, you can measure uh, susceptibility at different sites, so it can be interesting. If, you, if the physics is inhomogeneous, you can imagine that, uh, uh, I don't know, when you dope a high TC, the doping will be different on the different copper planes, and so the susceptibility of the different coppers will be different. And with NMR, you can probe that. 
uh, and uh, you can access local variation. This is a bit more specific, but very important. I'll give you an example. So uh, there's a price to pay for that, uh, that uh, is not by far not as easy as quid. And uh, it's uh, related to Carlo's question. Uh, it's not uh, always easy to have absolute values. So uh, defining your zero susceptibility is not always easy because you have this orbital shift, which is small but finite. And you have this hyperfine constant uh, that multiplies the local susceptibility and that usually you don't know. So you have a quantity that is proportional to the susceptibility, but the proportionality factor, you don't always know it very well. So let me give you uh, one uh, example in a rather simple material as compared to the one you hear at the, at the conference. Uh, so this is a spin Aldane uh, spin one uh, chain. And <coughs> Sorry. So uh, uh, here the, the spin one are from uh, nickel uh, and uh, the, the rest, uh, so the material is uh, yttrium 2, barium nickel 05, so and only nickel is uh, magnetic there, it's an insulator. Uh, and uh, so this nickel are, have some uh, antiferromagnetic coupling. Okay, so it's a spin one antiferromagnetic uh, chain and uh, we know that it should be, uh, it should be gapped. When you measure this system uh, in a squid, you, you get this black curve here. So susceptibility that, uh, which I will call sometimes a macroscopic susceptibility, or the one, well, the one you get for, from your uh, preferred magnetometer. And it's like that. So it goes down and then it goes up. So uh, from that, you would not say that it's gapped. Uh, the gap system, uh, the susceptibility should go to, to zero. Huh? There is no more, uh, if you have a, a gap and uh, to, a, to a ground state uh, that is a singlet, you expect that the, the susceptibility at t equals zero is zero and uh, that the susceptibility just follow gap behavior, uh, exponential delta over kBT. So this is really not what you have there. And it's tricky from that to know what is the, uh, what is the gap size and to compare it to theory, et cetera. Uh, here on the left, that's the measurement of the shift. Uh, that's here on the yttrium, I think. But anyway, uh, where you see, so there are two different measurements. But I, I don't go to the detail, but you see that they, they go uh, indeed like something that looks uh, exponential uh, at, the, at the beginning. And from that, you can uh, fit with the uh, activation law and get a gap value. You will notice that indeed uh, it doesn't go to zero, it goes to uh, the, uh, the orbital uh, shift. If I'm sure, your zero. But clearly, you, okay, you, you, you see the activated behavior. So now, when you know that, you can play the trick then to go back to your macroscopic susceptibility, you can try to fit the low temperature part and uh, subtract it out uh, to get these points that resemble the, uh, the NMR shift. So why do you have this uh, tail, I should, I should tell you? Uh, it's because uh, in your material, you always have some kind of impurities. Here, the impurities are mostly the fact that uh, in your material, the, the chains are finite. So they, had, uh, they, they are not infi infinite, so they, they stop somewhere. And when they stop, the end spin uh, behave like free spins, basically. So they will give you a term like a Curie term, C over T, like that, that will diverge at low temperature. And that kills any uh, effort to measure low temperature physics uh, at a macroscopic scale. Okay. Even if you don't have many, uh, they, they will dominate your, because it's C over T, so they will dominate your gap susceptibility that goes to zero. Okay. So when you do NMR, you don't care because uh, there are not many end spin and most of your yttrium, they probe a system that is really like an infinite chain. Okay, they are far from the ends. Okay. Yeah? Yeah? Wow. 
uh, you avoid the you avoid the, <laughs> the end problem. Experimentally, uh, it's more tricky, but uh, theoretically, you can do that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Then I don't know, theoretically, uh, you can ask uh, a theoretician, uh, spin one when it's uh, closed, I guess it depends on the number of, uh, of spin, if it's uh, odd or even, or for spin one, I don't know, for the Alden chain. Uh, okay, you can ask theoretician colleagues for that. But. Yeah. So this, this is, oh, sorry, this is LMR, which gives you the local susceptibility, actually, and the black one there, it's uh, the global susceptibility, what I call the squid susceptibility or macroscopic susceptibility. Okay. If you know the result, you can always take the macroscopic susceptibility and try to subtract something to get, to get it to zero there. Yeah. But it's a dangerous game if you don't know the answer before, because uh, this is not exactly C over T, it can be C over T plus some theta or something like that. So uh, you can, the way you subtract it, you can make it zero, finite, uh, negative if you wish, and you don't know what you do, basically. Okay, it's clear? No, the black are not from NMR. Yeah, exactly. So, a bit more involved, now you can intentionally try to cut your spin chain. Uh, this is easier maybe than trying to connect it back. Uh, yeah? Susceptibility, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to answer your question, I think. Just, just look at that. So in the pristine sample, you don't have that many end spin. So you're not sensitive because you don't have many nuclei coupled to this end spin. But you can increase this number of end spin. It's easy, you just have to cut your chain. You would say that you would observe the end mode. And then you can observe the end mode. So the, the way you do that is you put like some, uh, you substitute zinc for nickel. So nickel is your spin one and zinc has no spin. So if you put zinc, it, it's just like having a vacancy, it's just like cutting your spin chain. Okay. So if you put some amount, not too large, not to break the physics of the chain, uh, but not too small so that you have many of these uh, vacancy defects, then you can do the NMR there. So what you have, uh, so in the pristine pure sample without zinc, uh, that's the uh, yttrium uh, spectrum, okay, there's one, um, it's rather homogeneous, and that's from the shift of this line that uh, I was showing the, the local susceptibility. And now if you add some, uh, some zinc, like 2%, you see that, okay, you still have your uh, uh, pristine behavior, but on top of that, you have some kind of satellite that develops uh, there. Uh, which uh, have to be related to the end spin, so to what happens close to the, to the zinc. Okay. And uh, so here it gets very interesting. So it tells you that when you are close to the zinc, actually the local field is very different from a uh, region where you are in the, in the bulk of the chain, if you want, with a local field that can be very strong, actually. Okay. So the, the understanding of that is this one. Champ locales mean uh, local field. Sorry, I didn't translate. Um, so it looks like that. So what happens, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a correlated system. So imagine you have a paramagnetic system, like a very standard paramagnetic system with no correlation. You remove one spin, well, nothing happens. Okay, well, the rest of the spin, they just don't respond. But in a correlated system, it's not like that. You remove one spin, the system has a correlation lens, it will try to screen your defect somehow. Okay. And that's what uh, the way it screens or it responds to this, to this vacancy in, in the spin one chain is by developing a staggered magnetization like that in the vicinity of your defect. 
<laughs> so if your yttrium sits next to this first nickel, it will feel a very strong external uh, local field. So that when you are sitting there, the resonance frequency will be very far from the, the, the pure uh, response. If you, okay. if you get a bit further away from the defect, then uh, the magnetization alternates, so you will have a response there with a slightly smaller local field, then a response there, then there, then there, etc. Okay? So you know uh, where are your nuclei that you're probing with respect to a zinc huh, from crystallography, so you know the distance. So from that you can reconstruct uh, the variation of the, the local field or the susceptibility as a function of the distance to an impurity. Okay. And this, then you can compare the theory that's related to the correlation length of your spin one chain, etc. And that's very unique. This, uh, you cannot do, uh, I don't know, over techniques that NMR where you can do that. Okay. If you put that in a macroscopic uh, squid, uh, you have the average of all this response, uh, which gives you something that is more or less paramagnetic. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you have, if I don't tell you anything about the physics of your system, I just give you a spectrum. Okay, uh, okay. you cannot reconstruct. Uh, it's okay. You have, you have to think. You know a bit what you expect, etc. You have to assume that you see uh, that there is not another small satellite there uh, when you tr try to um, plot uh, the magnetization versus distance. Uh, you have to be sure that you have the latest, the, the final uh, state there. Otherwise, you may miss the first one because maybe it gives too much relaxation or something. So it can be a bit tricky, etc. But yeah, if you're completely in the dark, uh, uh, don't use NMR as a first tool. I mean, when you know where, really well your system, then you do NMR. It's quite involved, and so uh, you, you need to work on something. You, you know more or less what you're doing. Okay. Let, let me move on to, um, maybe a bit short, but okay. Let me move on to um, a relaxation process now and how you are sensitive not only to uh, the, so with the shift you are sensitive to the static susceptibility. Now I'll show you that somehow you're sensitive to the dynamical susceptibility and to, to fluctuation in your system. So let me show you how it works. Uh, so uh, if you put your sample in an external magnetic field, you polarize the nuclear magnetization. So the red uh, arrow here is the total nuclear magnetization in your system, okay? the sum of all the nuclear spins. So it's like that, that's your initial state. So imagine, I'll, uh, if I have time, I'll show you how you do that, but okay, imagine I have a trick to somehow prepare my system so that the magnetization is not along Z, but in the perpendicular plane. So it means uh, in, uh, in quantum uh, wording, it means that uh, the, the two population and my, uh, on the, if I have the spin one half, the two population plus one half and minus one half are equal. Okay. I managed to do that, okay? And then I let the system evolve. What will happen? We know that uh, if the spin makes some angle to B0, that was the first slide, the spin, they rotate, they process around B0. Okay, so that's what, what is happening. So this will continue for a long time, many, many precession, but at some point uh, you lose this uh, transverse magnetization. Why you lose it is because your spin, they don't have all the same uh, Larmor frequency, they have different speeds. So at the end of the day, they still process in this picture, they're still, they are still there, they're still processing, but they are uh, completely out of phase. So the, the total magnetization uh, averages to zero. Okay. That's what is called T2 process. I will not go too much into that. But uh, if you wait a bit longer, and then at some point, your spin should come up uh, back to their uh, equilibrium uh, situation. So uh, along uh, A0 or B0. 
This is a completely different process. It means that uh, you are changing the population on your levels. So somehow you have to exchange energy okay, to change this, uh, this population. And that's why it's very interesting because your nuclear spin system has to exchange some energy with the surrounding. It's called the lattice. Uh, so that this relaxation time is called spin lattice relaxation time. Lattice means anything. So any degree of freedom around your nuclei can act to uh, exchange energy with your system and relax the population of your nucleus back to equilibrium. Okay. Uh, so in our case, uh, that can be a magnetic fluctuation, spin excitation that will help your system to relax back to equilibrium. So uh, the description of this uh, semi-classical level is given by a block equation. Uh, we know that's what I, I've just told, that the, long, the, the magnetization relaxes back uh, along uh, H0. So let, let's go a bit uh, into the detail for this. So imagine, uh, so I take the simple example of uh, spin one half, like proton and MR. My two, uh, so I put my system in a H0 uh, field. And uh, that's the equilibrium population. The, the, the circles are uh, nucle nucleus. Okay. Uh, N plus is the population of uh, these nuclei on the, on the lowest level and N minus on the highest level. They are separated by the Zeeman energy related to the Larmor frequency. Okay. So I want to know how this population evolves. Okay. So the rate of change of uh, the population N plus, for instance, uh, it changes, why it changes this population? It changes because you have some spin that can go from the upper level down with a rate of uh, probability uh, that I call W down. And it changes also because some of the spin, they can be promoted to the upper level with a rate uh, which I call W up. Okay, that's clear. So then you can manipulate that a little bit. The quantity that is maybe more uh, useful is the difference of population uh, between the two levels. You can introduce that uh, there. And uh, then you have an equation like that for uh, your difference of uh, population on the two levels. And you see it's a standard relaxation where uh, I have introduced a relaxation time, characteristic time T1, uh, that is just the sum of these two rates. So at the end of the day, so the, the population, you expect that the difference of population, that is basically what you measure with NMR, uh, is relaxing. So N0 is the equilibrium uh, difference of population. And so if you perturb your system, it will relax back to equilibrium with a characteristic time T1 that is directly related to this microscopic uh, probability rate. Okay. And that's very, uh, so let, let me, uh, let me finish with that. Uh, it's even simpler than that because um, in, uh, in NMR, so this, uh, this spacing, as I told you right from the beginning, the nuclear magnetization is very small. So this energy difference will always be very small. It's, if you put numbers, it's like uh, micro Kelvin, basically. So for nuclear levels, you're always in a, at finite temperature, you are always in a high temperature limit. So in the high temperature limit, the two rates uh, they can be considered as equal. So basically, uh, 1 over T1 is two times uh, one uh, microscopic uh, individual process for a spin to flip from one level to the other. Okay. And that's very interesting because uh, this quantity is, uh, you have a direct link, if you want, with a macroscopic quantity. That's what you measure directly in NMR. And this is what you can compute in theory. Basically, that's a microscopic process. You should be able to compute that uh, from your theory. Okay. So let me give you a, a bit more detail on that. So uh, if you want to compute this microscopic uh, rate, probability rate there, you can use your Fermi-Golden rule. Uh, here, the perturbation, time-dependent perturbation is the fluctuation of your local field. So that's the hyperfine uh, coupling here. And now I'm taking 
uh, really uh, into account the fact that the local field may fluctuate. And this fluctuation, they can help your system then to, uh, to, to switch from one level to the other. So it's a bit tedious, but at the end of the day, uh, when you do that, uh, obviously 1 over T1 is uh, related to the uh, fluctuation of your local field. Okay? The plus and minus are for the uh, in-plane component of H. Uh, it's natural that the, um, uh, that the transverse uh, fluctuation of the field that helps the system go, uh, going from one level to the other. The longitudinal field, uh, they, they cannot uh, fluctuation, uh, longitudinal fluctuation, they cannot induce uh, transition. Okay, so uh, fluctuation of the local fields, they are obviously related to fluctuation of the spin. Uh, that's the spin that gives the local field, the spin of the electrons. So uh, you can uh, rewrite it like that. So uh, 1 over T1 is just related to the fluctuation of the, of the spin. Okay. If you wish, you, you can rewrite it. The fluctuations are related to the dissipation. You can rewrite it as a function of chi double prime. So at the end of the day, 1 over T1 uh, is measuring this uh, quantity. So chi double prime of Q and omega, uh, that's the quantity that you measure uh, very clearly with inelastic Newton scattering. Uh, you will see that in the, in the next uh, talk. With NMR, you've got a slightly di well, completely different view that can be sometimes uh, complementary uh, to neutron. Uh, and especially, uh, we are probing this quantity, this dynamical uh, susceptibility at the Larmor frequency, omega n. And as I told you, it's a very tiny energy. So it's very close uh, to, to zero. So as compared to neutron, uh, we are probing the energy spectrum uh, with a very, very low energy uh, scale. Okay. So for instance, if you have a tiny gap in your system, you may not have a resolution with inelastic Newton scattering, but with NMR, provided you can cool down your system below the temperature of the gap, uh, you, will, uh, you, will, uh, you will detect it. Now, you, the form is a bit complex. That's normal because uh, NMR is a local probe. There is no resolution in Q space. It, what it means, it, uh, it's a local probe. So that's why you have the summation over Q. Okay? You, uh, with NMR, you cannot have a resolution uh, in the reciprocal space. Okay? So let me uh, show you one example. So I, I come back to the same uh, spin one. It comes uh, from this guy, I guess, when you use the fluctuation dissipation theorem, basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but uh, when you go from one Tesla to 20 Tesla, you go from one micro Kelvin to 20 micro Kelvin and it stays small. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is the same uh, spin one chain, okay? Uh, this is one over T1 measurement, and uh, this is, uh, okay, it's not a renewed plot, but okay, it's a log versus temperature, and the, the line is uh, just uh, exponential activation low, okay? And from there, you can measure with good accuracy the, the spin gap, uh, no problem. Uh, here, it's an over system uh, that's uh, an array news plot here. It's also uh, very nice. What I would like to mention is here, you, you see that this T1, uh, the, the time it takes for the system to relax, uh, it changes a lot, obviously, uh, when you enter the, the, the gap, when you have no more excitation. So the gap means you have no more excitation, so your system does not relax anymore. And your T1 changes by orders of magnitude. It's not like a small change. So in principle, with T1, you're very, very sensitive to, to the gap. It's not like the susceptibility. If susceptibility, you could wonder whether your susceptibility goes to zero or not, whether it's really exponential or not. Here, OK, it's orders of magnitude. You cannot miss it. Okay. And that's the same uh, if you measure superconductors, superconductivity. If you, uh, if you have a standard BCS superconductivity, you expect that you have a gap. So your T1 will be gapped, and you can measure the superconducting gap. 
Uh, if it's non-conventional with nodes or something like that, uh, uh, it will not be a gap behavior. Uh, you will have rather a power law, etc. So you can distinguish with T1 uh, the, the, the structure of, uh, of the excitation in your system, basically. Okay. Yeah, Carlo? How you get it? This I will show you. Uh, I will try. That it, somehow you have to uh, perturb your system, and you see you 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 see how it gets back to equilibrium. Basically, uh, I will try to show you that the last part. But <laughs> I'll try to show you that. Uh, yeah, maybe we have a, just a little bit of time for that. That that's a somewhat different uh, example. That's just to show you. Uh, in the, the formula of the one over T1, you have this strange guy here, which I did not comment, uh, which is the Fourier transform of the hyperfine coupling. So it's usually a bit annoying. So it means that you, you're not directly sum, summing chi of Q, but there is some um, weight in front of the different Q values of, um, of chi, and that, that can be annoying, and that, that can be used in some uh, cases. So let, let me show you that. So if, if you have, just let me comment, if you have a contact uh, interaction, for instance, A uh, of uh, A of Q uh, is a constant, because uh, A of R is a Dirac, so A of Q is a constant, it's just a scalar that you can take out of your summation. So in some case, or at the first approximation, you can forget about it, okay? But in some cases, it's important. So let me show you this, uh, this example in uh, high TC superconductors. It's uh, yttrium barium cobalt, uh, uh, copper oxide. Uh, so high TC superconductor. And in the pseudogap uh, regime, so uh, that uh, we are above uh, uh, the superconducting temperature, and in the normal state of the, of the material where it's conducting, but it has this, uh, this you saw yesterday, it has this uh, interesting non Fermi liquid uh, behavior with, uh, in, in particular, a pseudo gap in the susceptibility. Uh, the susceptibility is not constant, uh, it shows some depression at some temperature. It's not exactly a gap, it doesn't go like to zero or something like that, it just change a bit uh, and uh, probably it means that you have something happening that could be related to superconductivity okay well uh, okay uh, anyway you measure one over t1 there and this system they are very good because you can measure yttrium uh, nmr copper nmr oxygen nmr you can compare all that so it's a nice playground for for nmr so here it's a comparison of uh, one over t1 for copper and for oxygen if you measure the, sh the shift for copper and oxygen, it's the same. You have this uh, pseudo gap uh, change. But the 1 over T1 is very different. And the reason is the following. So for copper, here uh, you have okay, different interaction, but basically uh, you have on site interaction. Uh, your, so the, the electrons, they live most of the time on the, on the copper side, and uh, they, they interact directly with uh, the nuclei there. So uh, you will have a constant term in uh, the, this uh, Fourier transform, which I call alpha here, which is the most important. And that is there, so you can take this one out. So you're basically summing all uh, the, the component of, of chi double prime. So whatever the kind of fluctuation you have in your system, whether they are ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic, whatever, uh, if your copper moment fluctuates, you pick it up in one over T1 measure at the copper side. On the oxygen side, is different because, <clears throat> well, uh, the, the electrons, they, they don't live so, so much on the, on the oxygen. So wh what you see is uh, you, you are coupled to two coppers on, on both sides, symmetrically. And so the, the Fourier transform of this guy looks like that. Uh, and so you, you see immediately, so either mathematically, you see immediately that uh, if you have fluctuation, anti-ferromagnetic fluctuation at a vector pi, pi over two, pi over two, this guy vanishes, it's zero. 
the unwaving argument is just because your oxygen is at a symmetric position. So if on the copper you have antiferromagnetic fluctuation, they are filtered out at the oxygen site. Okay. So in this summation for oxygen, you will remove k of q when k of when q is, is the antiferromagnetic wave vector. And that explains the difference there. On the copper, you have all the fluctuation and uh, they get uh, very strong, uh, you get very strong antiferromagnetic fluctuation when you are close to the pseudo gap. On the oxygen, uh, you, have, you also see the fluctuation, but because you are removing the enhanced fluctuation, which are the antiferromagnetic fluctuation, you have a T1 that, uh, stays, uh, that stays longer. Okay. So that's a very nice uh, proof somehow that you have antiferromagnetic fluctuation uh, in, your, uh, in your system. I still have about 10 minutes, yes. So I'll be very short with that so that I can give you a bit of uh, technical uh, <laughs> elements to understand what we are measuring in the lab. So uh, just to mention that for when your nuclear spin are larger than uh, one half, they are, uh, the, it's, it's related to the, the, the distribution of charge in the, uh, at the, in the nuclei. It's no more uh, spherical, it has some shape. And then uh, the nuclei, the nucleus, and the spin of the nucleus uh, can couple, can yeah, interact, couple, uh, to uh, the electrostatic charges that you have around. So you are sensitive at the end of the day. Uh, here we, we are not dealing with magnetic field, we are dealing with the electric field. So in a bit more detail, what you are sensitive, you are coupling to the, you are interacting with the second derivative of the local electrostatic potential. So that's why it's called the electric field gradient. That's the gradient of the electric field, that's the second derivative of the potential. For to so know from the uh, the charge which are around. So imagine you you're doing copper NMR. Your copper is uh, in uh, oxygen octahedron. The oxygen are more or less oxygen two minus. They will create some electric field at the nucleus. So exactly how crystal field works. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You you can have a very good picture with point charge model uh, uh, from your your crystal. Yeah, exactly. So I uh, will not go too much into the detail, but basically, so your, uh, the, uh, the distribution of charge of your nucleus, that's nuclear physics, that's fixed for a given nuclei. This you find also in the, in the NMR tables. That's this, it's quantified by this quantity Q, uh, which is the so-called quadrupolar uh, moment of your uh, nuclei. It tells you how much the, the nucleus is non-spherical. And uh, it, it's coupled to uh, the VZZ, so that's the second derivative of the potential along some axis. So that's the one of the eigenvalue of the EFG tensor, uh, that's the maximal uh, eigenvalue of the EFG tensor. So, so this quantity, we call it usually nu q, and that's the quadrupolar interaction that just quantifies, uh, that's the magnitude of the quadrupolar interaction. Uh, the only problem is that the, uh, this quantity depends actually on the direction of the principal axis of your EFG with respect to the applied field. So it's a little bit tricky because then uh, it means that this interaction depends how your crystal is oriented with, with respect to the applied field. That gives a bit of complication uh, in the story, but that's also very useful. So it looks like that. So if you have a spin five half, for instance, uh, with a Zeeman splitting, it looks like that. So you have your uh, equally spaced uh, level and you have just one uh, transition because uh, that's always the same spacing between the, the lines. So imagine that would be this, this line here. Now with quadrupolar interaction, all the levels are slightly modified. And now the, the spacing is not the same anymore between the levels, so uh, it will, uh, you, you will end up with five different transitions for one nucleus. 
So what we call the central line, which is the transition between minus one half and one half, and two, two pairs of satellites on each, on each side. That's for a spin five half. For a spin three half, you will have three lines, etc. Okay. And the spacing between two, two lines depends on uh, the orientation of your sample with respect to a zero. Maybe I will well, I just say one, one, one thing with that. So the good point is, yeah, I show an example where the, you have a large, that's usually the case, you, have a very, you apply a large field, you have a large demand splitting, and the quadrupolar uh, per, uh, interaction is a perturbation to your system. Now, you could imagine also that because of quadrupolar interaction, there is already a splitting of your nuclear levels. You don't need the Zeeman, you don't need to apply a field, actually, because it's splitted by the quadrupolar interaction. So if the quadrupolar interaction is large enough, you can do NMR without an applied field, just using the quadrupolar interaction. That's called nuclear quadrupolar resonance, and that can be very useful. If you want to measure like uh, the superconducting state, for instance, uh, you don't want to apply a field. You don't want to close the gap with the applied field, uh, so it can be very interesting to do NQR, for instance. So this is one uh, example that's in a, in a uh, charge density wave uh, material, uh, where it's, it is NQR, actually, so there's no applied field. Uh, that's uh, NQR of uh, the rubidium, which is a spin-free half, so you have one uh, NQR transition. And uh, you see, uh, basically, you see the evolution of the spectrum. It changes a lot around 180 k. That's where you have the charge density wave order. So you have a, uh, a modulation of the position of the molybdium at, at this temperature. So uh, a modulation of the electrostatic uh, charges, if you want. So that will change, that will modulate uh, the quadrupolar uh, interaction. And that gives this, uh, this uh, very uh, particular shape, which is double horn. And that, that's uh, when you follow the width of your uh, line, it gives you the order parameter, basically, of uh, your charge density wave. OK. So just to finish on quadrupolar interaction, uh, so it, it can be interesting because, yeah. 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 So what what you get is uh, the the splitting of a line, the well, this broadening of a line, uh, which is uh, the display is proportional to uh, the modulation of your quadrupolar interaction, and the quadrupolar the modulation of a quadrupolar interaction is the it's the modulation of uh, V, which is the, the electrostatic potential. It means that your electrostatic potential is, is changing from side to side, basically. And from the shape, you could say that it's like a cosine, and so it's like a charge density wave. Uh, I don't have a good answer right right now. Basically. What is the exit? Yeah, some uh, some. Uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I would have to think. Here in in this specific case, you could have done an MR. You could have. A, I've also the, the shift. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's a big reason to do NQR there, or, but I, I would have to check. So anyway, with, NQ, with uh, quadrupolar effect, so uh, the good thing is uh, you are uh, sensitive to the structure somehow. If you have a change in the structure, you will see it immediately in your spectrum because the, 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 the electrostatic potential will change. Uh, you can okay. Do, you can do uh, some kind of NMR without an external field, so you lose all the information on the magnetism. But okay, you can get some some other information. 
the, the limitations are that the spectra are more complex. Uh, you have, uh, and uh, in a polycrystalline sample, uh, then you have uh, complexity because uh, okay you have a powder pattern you have all the different angles uh, that are uh, present so that that uh, makes the, the, the pattern a bit more complex uh, I'm running out of time um, I can give you uh, this example that that, uh, that should be fast um, that's just a tiny introduction you will have uh, two at least two talks on this uh, on these topics uh, so this is uh, Herbert Smith site that's a, a very good representative of the uh, antiferromagnetic Kagome model. So it's an uh, antiferromagnetically co coupled copper spin with a strong antiferromagnetic interaction. And uh, the, the coppers are on the Kagome lattice. So when you do the NMR on uh, crystals like that, it's uh, oxygen 17 NMR, it's a spin five half. So you expect five lines. Okay. When you do the NMR, you get more than five lines, uh, actually in even more than 10. Uh, this, uh, we did that in, uh, in Orsay, in my lab. Uh, it's been done uh, at the MIT. Uh, it was, you get the same spectrum, basically. And so it tells you immediately that uh, from the crystallography, you expect only one oxygen site. So you should have only five lines and that's it. So the fact that you see many more lines tells you that you have some kind, some, some different environment in your material. And probably what we think is that there, is a, there are some defects there, some, some copper, they may go there and give you a different environment. So the red balls are the oxygen. So most of the oxygen, they are in this kind of environment with zinc here and three coppers. But some of them, they will see four coppers. So they will have a different local field. So they will uh, give five over lines uh, shifted with respect to the main ones. Basically. And this is quite immediate. When you put your sample in the, in the experiment, you know if you have one site or many sites. And most of the time, you end up with something that is slightly different from uh, what you get from crystallography. Uh, so it's a, a very local uh, view on the structure uh, that you get from an MR. Okay, and now but you can play the game to follow one of these lines. So either a line for the, this kind of uh, uh, environment or this kind, you follow it with respect with, uh, with temperature and you can uh, try to figure out uh, what is the susceptibility in one case or the other. So uh, if you measure that the macroscopic susceptibility of Herbert Smith site, it's uh, monotonic, very boring, but actually it's not at all like that. When you look at the local susceptibility, it's decreasing and you can wonder whether it's going to zero or not, etc. I don't go into details, you will hear talks about that. And you can try to measure also the susceptibility when you are close to a defect. And that's very interesting also. Uh, if you remember what I say about uh, uh, defects in the spin one chain, here you can try to get the same physics for the Kagome lattice. I should stop here. Yeah, a couple of minutes. It depends on you. You want to hear a bit about technique or not? Or you're tired? You want to go for coffee or NMR technique? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, macroscopic susceptibility, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's about J over 2. J over 2. Oh, I'm saying in your experimental data, what is that temperature below which it... Um... Yeah, so it's uh, 100K, uh, uh, between 50 and 100K. So J is about 200K, and the maximum is around uh, J over 2. Okay. So, should this you will ask questions. So you will have talks by uh, Ta Takeshi Mai this afternoon, Philip Mendels next week. So you will have plenty of time to ask, or we can discuss later if you want. But that's that's not the point here. Uh, so we go for five minutes on techniques or not? Yeah. Okay. So.
that that just pictures. Ah, this one is not pictures. Sorry. So the important, just the important thing to to have in mind is, imagine. So you have your your nuclear spins, uh, the red or row, and uh, you apply. Uh, so it's in uh, the external field is zero, and now on top of that you apply. Uh, external uh, small field B1 that is oscillating, that is actually rotating at some frequency omega. Okay, a small field that is rotating perpendicular to a zero. You work out the, 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 the evolution of the magnetization for the system, it looks like that, in the good, that's just the torque expressed in the rotating frame. And you, you see immediately that if you choose well your rotation of H1, the rotation speed, if it's exactly equal to the Larmor frequency, so if omega is exactly gamma at zero, this term will vanish. So then the evolution of your magnetization, nuclear magnetization, is very uh, simple in the rotating frame. It's just a rotation. We find again this equation of precision. It's, uh, it's just a rotation around H1 axis uh, with a rate gamma time h1. So what it means is that if you're able to produce a field like that, perpendicular to a zero, uh, rotating at a, the right frequency, the Larmor frequency, then it means you're able to manipulate uh, the magnetization as you wish. You rotate it by an angle which just depends on the time t the duration of the application of H1. Okay. So you can make it pi over two, you can flip the magnetization in the plane, you can um, uh, exchange the population with a pi pulse, etc. Okay. So in the language of uh, quantum computing, you would say that you can prepare your spin state uh, as at will. Okay. On the block sphere, you can manipulate it as you wish. And that's, that's a very important technique. Do you know how you make a rotating field? Wait, well, either you take uh, uh, coils in quadrature, etc. that's very complicated, but we are, we are lazy, so we don't do that. Uh, if you take a, just a oscillating field in one direction, you can always decompose it in two rotating fields. One would be at the Larmor frequency, the other would be out of resonance at two omega zero. Okay, so a rotating field is just an oscillating field. So this is how it works. You put your sample in an external field, you apply the oscillating field at the right frequency that helps to flip the, <coughs> uh, the magnetization. You let the system evolve and uh, like that. And uh, so uh, that's a T2 process, magnetization disappears, and then you have T1 process, it comes back along with you. So how do you measure that? So you put your sample in a large magnetic field, homogeneous, you use a spectrometer in the megahertz, uh, in the radio frequency range, 100 megahertz range. You send, so the, the probe is a bit deceptive, it's just a tongue circuit, basically, with a coil at the end. So that's the small coil uh, that uh, where you put your sample in and that produce the small uh, time dependent H1 field. It's the, the few, uh, it's one millitesla typically that you produce there. It's a very small field, but at the right frequency. So you do that, you send a pulse to this, uh, uh, to, where, to the coil where is your sample. That creates the oscillating field that allows you to flip the magnetization. You stop doing anything. So the, now the, the rotation of the magnetization means that you have uh, a magnetic flux that varies with time in your coil. So that gives a voltage at your coil that, and that's the quantity that you measure. So what you measure is something like that, a voltage that oscillates with time at the Larmor frequency, basically. And then if you Fourier transform that, uh, you've got your spectrum. Okay. I will not go to more details than that, I think. That's your spectrum. Uh, this, 
I will forget this, I will forget. To answer your question, Carlo, then when you know that you can do whatever you want with a good, uh, good pulse, so what you could do is prepare your system in a state, for instance, you prepare it with the magnetization in plane. And then you, uh, you apply a second pi, pi over two pulse. You wait some time and you apply a second pi over two pulse. So if in between your two pulse, the spin has the time to get back to equilibrium, you start from zero with your second pulse and you get a nice NMR spectrum. If the spin were still in the plane, uh, that uh, you didn't wait enough as compared to T1, uh, then uh, the second pulse will just flip them along uh, Z and nothing will happen. You will have no precession and no signal. So you basically measure the signal you get as a function of the time between two pulse and uh, you see you extract uh, T1 from that. So it's uh, how it works. But it's always basically using pulses to manipulate the magnetization. Okay, so just to summarize, so NMR is a local probe technique. I think you understand what it means now. You can probe the static susceptibility, the fluctuation, somehow the structures. Uh, it usually requires an applied field, but not always. And with that, I hope you will be able to understand further talks in the conference. Let's thank Fabrice for the wonderful talk. Uh, we can take a couple of very brief questions. <laughs> If there are any, uh, Andre, please. Thank you, Fabrice. It was a really nice talk. Um, so I will like to go to uh, this example that you had for uh, for the Haldane system. So you said that in both dynamical and static response, you see a gap, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, the question is, why is uh, the dynamical, so the T1 measurement, superior in the sense uh, of measuring the gap? In, I mean, what's uh, it? It's just because, um, but as you know, uh, the problem is, so in the case of the Alden gap, the gap is large. Okay, so uh, the low temperature regime where you are below the gap is quite extended. So you see in the, in the local susceptibility, you see nicely that uh, the susceptibility is really flat, etc. So you can think that you have a nice zero value. Uh, in some cases where when the gap is smaller, uh, you don't see that clearly the, the, the gap and uh, the gap regime and the susceptibility very flat, etc. So you, you are not completely sure if it's gapped or not. And you're, you know in Herbert Smith site, for instance, there's this problem to know whether the susceptibility really goes to zero or not. You know that you have prefactors. It's usually not a simple exponential law. So there are prefactors that uh, can smear out a bit the, the behavior and it's not always obvious to know uh, what, what is the, the the, the, so the end, point with T1 is that it, it usually varies by orders of magnitude and that it's easy to, to pick up, as you know. The energy scale is the same, right? So but the energy scale is the same. Huh? You should measure the same. Yeah. I guess it's also the precision, right, of the, how, how you measure the T1, right? I mean, you have more precision in the measuring the relaxation curve of magnetization than in measuring the position. Yeah, yeah, susceptibility. Well, it's all, it all, all, all dependent on system, on uh, hyperfine coupling, etc. how your probe is coupled. But uh, from experience, yes, uh, when, uh, when, when, you have a, when your T1 changes from 0.1 uh, second to 10 seconds, you, you see it in your experiment. Okay, that's okay. yeah, thank you. Yeah, you want to ask? Hi, Zoom, there's a question. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh. Uh, do you know who raised the hand? Uh, the online participant who raised the hand, please go ahead with your question. Okay, uh, if there are no immediate questions from the offline, then I suggest that we discuss over tea and coffee.
we'll have a short break, so about 20 minutes, and let's be back a minute or two before 11.30 when we have Bella's talk on a neutron scattering technique and for frustrated magnets. Thank you. Let's thank Fabrice again. Mm -hmm.